Good morning, directors Nelson, Bianco, and Estrada. Can we just do a quick mic check, make sure we can hear you in the boardroom? Sure, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Director Nelson. Thank you. Director Bianco? Can you hear my typing? Okay, perfect. Thank you, Director Estrada? Yes, I'm here. Perfect. Thank you so much. We're good. Thank you. Peter. Yes, sir. Hey, um. Are we good to go? And we have a hard stop at 11. Um, Cuspolo has a call and then Nelson has a call at 10. Oh, I think 11 is very accommodating, accommodative possibility. Good. Well, then I'll, I'll call to order the study session of Coachella Valley Water District Board of Directors here in um, Palm Desert, August 3rd. I can't believe it's August 2021. And this meeting is being held um, in person and by Zoom, uh, live streamed on our district website. I don't have a script today. Oh, maybe it got sent to you instead of me. You want to read it? <laughs> I think I need to read this. I, I would like to make clear for the record that this meeting is being conducted by teleconference pursuant to the Brown Act waivers provided for under the governor's executive orders in response to the COVID-19 state of emergency. Today's meeting is presented in a hybrid format, both in person at CBW's Steve Robbins Administration Building and via Zoom. The governor's executive orders N25-20 and N29-20 suspend certain requirements of the Brown Act and district board members and staff may choose to participate in person or by video conference. Um, I think I've already mentioned that. Members of the public who wish to comment on any item on the agenda have three minutes. 
Public comment may be provided in person via Zoom or by emailing the clerk of the board in advance of the meeting. If you are on Zoom, please use the hand raise feature to get our attention. Uh, some such comments will become part of the board meeting record. And um, there will be no ac action today. It's only a study session, but I'll make sure to call on individual directors uh, in to, to make sure that they are able to participate. There's an agenda somewhere too. I'm guessing we have a Pledge of Allegiance coming up at some point. Uh, yeah, I called to order already. Why don't we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I don't really have these things. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I think maybe we need to put names on this slide. <laughs> you got, well, I got my pillow. <laughs> and then a roll call, please. Good morning, President Powell. Oh, here it is. Here. Uh, Vice President Estrada. Here. Director Bianco. Here. Director Aguilar. Here. And Director Nelson. Here. Okay. So yeah, so we have all all five board members in attendance. Two of us are here, and three are on Zoom. attending virtually. And we have one item of study today. Did, did we have any public, anyone wishing to make public comment at this time? Hey, John, I, I have a quick question. We, the, it came up while we were uh, in the waiting room. Um, is crew going to happen in person this year or what's, Ye yes. what's happening there? Yeah, crew is supposed to happen in person this year in Vegas. Okay, great. Thanks. In December. Yep. That's what I hear. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good. Stay tuned. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah, I would. No kidding. I wouldn't book non-refundable airfare or whatever at this point. Uh, all right. So, uh, did we have anyone public? I I didn't hear any. I I don't see any. Um, we do have a few participants, uh, attendees, on the line. If any of you are interested in providing public comment, if you could please use the raise your hand feature, and I will unmute you. Well, just let me know if we do. All right, so presenting today is Zoe Rodriguez Del Rey. We have the uh, Indio Subbasin and Mission Creek Subbasin Alternative Plan updates. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, President Powell, members of the board. Um, so uh, we've been working diligently uh, on the Indio Subbasin and Mission Creek Subbasin Alternative Plan updates uh, and uh, we are doing uh, this board study session to uh, bring the board up to speed on uh, some of the elements of those updates, particularly as it relates to uh, demand and supply assumptions. Um, and so before I begin, uh, I do want to thank uh, the consultants that have been helping us on this effort, on the Indio Subbasin, Todd Groundwater, and Woodland Current and for the Mission Creek Subbasin, um, Wood and Kennedy Jenks. I uh, also want to thank the other groundwater sustainability agencies, which I will henceforth refer to as GSAs. Hey, Zoe, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I got a message from Director Estrada. If you could speak up or if we could raise her volume, please. Thank you. And I will also uh, get way closer to the microphone. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, I'd like to thank the other groundwater sustainability agencies that have been participating in these alternative plan updates. Uh, we have a lot of material to cover today, and this is just um, focusing on an area of the update, so I will try to move through things quickly. I do encourage the board to ask questions along the way, uh, but I'll also be trying to practice some time management to uh, get, the, get us through all these slides uh, by 11 a.m. So with that, I will go ahead and proceed. Uh, so what we see here is a timeline of uh, CDWD's history of compliance with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act going back to 2014, September of 2014, uh, when uh, SIGMA was signed into law. 
Uh, as the board knows, uh, we had existing water management plans for the Indio Subbasin and Mission Creek Subbasin that were submitted uh, as Sigma allowed as alternative, uh, alternative to a groundwater sustainability plan. Uh, and those were submitted at the end of 2016. Uh, about two years later, in July of 2019, we heard from the Department of Water Resources, DWR, that those plans had been approved as alternatives. And uh, as Sigma requires, uh, we immediately began to undertake the first five-year update. Uh, that first five-year update is due to DWR by um, January 1 of 2022. Uh, in the interim, we've been uh, in as w one of the few agencies that has approved alternative plans. We were kind of on the forefront of submitting uh, annual reports and have been doing that for several years, and we'll be doing our next one by uh, April of 2022. So the Coachella Valley has taken uh, a collaborative approach to complying with uh, Sigma in both the Indio Subbasin and Mission Creek Subbasin. Uh, on the left, we see the boundary of the Indio Subbasin and uh, the GSAs, uh, which include uh, Desert Water Agency, DWA, Coachella Valley Water District, CDWD, Indio Water Authority, IWA, and Coachella Water uh, Authority, CWA. Uh, and these agencies collaborated in submitting uh, the alternative plan, but they're also collaborating uh, in preparing annual reports and working closely to update um, uh, the alternative plan. In the Mission Creek Subbasin, the two GSAs, uh, DWA and CBWD, have been working collaboratively with the Mission Springs Water District uh, through a similar process. Uh, there's quite a few benefits of working collaboratively that uh, includes um, being able to coordinate on management. Uh, and, and we've seen this as we've started to see other areas prepare GSP. There's also quite a bit of streamlining when it comes to Sigma compliance when you collaborate behind um, a single plan for a sub-basin. Uh, there's also data sharing, there's some cost-sharing benefits to all agencies. Uh, and, um, you know, this is just a, a really good approach that we're all collaborating. It, all mean, it also means that as we prepare these alternative plan updates, that we are getting inputs from all of the GSAs and participating agencies uh, in the shape of uh, this update. So uh, briefly, uh, what does this update involve? Well, first of all, it, it required an assessment of uh, the existing plans and then to update those. And uh, what we mean by update them was to look at uh, water demand forecasts, how were those holding up relative to what the 2010 plan, uh, Coachella Valley Water Management Plan, and uh, the 2013 Mission Creek Garnet Hill water management plans uh, had forecasted. Uh, also looking at water supply projections and seeing what that means, both in terms of being able to meet uh, projected future water demands, but also in terms of uh, addressing overdraft, um, having a balanced groundwater basin and meeting the sustainability goals of Sigma. Uh, we also, when the, when the plans were approved, we received recommendations from the Department of Water Resources, DWR, uh, and we needed to address those as well. Uh, as part of uh, this assessment and update, we also looked at all of the projects and management actions that were part of those initial plans uh, and updated them uh, based both on the findings of uh, projected demand and supply, uh, in other words, changing conditions from uh, those planning assumptions, but also uh, to update plans uh, or projects that were not included in the initial plan, an example being the Palm Desert Groundwater Replenishment Facility. Uh, and we also needed to integrate some of the Sigma-specific projects and management uh, actions that are required to support implementation of uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. 
So uh, I'm going to begin with the uh, Indio Subbasin. Uh, you'll notice that there's a, a lot more detail in uh, this particular section of the presentation. Uh, and that is in part because, uh, first of all, it's a larger, more complex basin. Uh, there were more recommendations. Uh, but also because a lot of the assumptions, and particularly as it relates to supply, uh, dovetail in uh, to the Mission Creek. So there's been a lot of coordination in those plan updates from everything from the modeling uh, to demand uh, assumptions and supply assumptions. Zoe, is that the last um, official update we've had, January 2012? Sorry, are you, are you referring to the 2010 plan when it was? You had a photo on that last slide and it showed January 2012. Oh, okay, so, so yeah, so we normally refer to the Coachella Valley Water Management Plan as the 2010 update, but it was uh, finalized in 2012. That is the last official update that we've had. In the interim, there were two status reports prepared uh, that already started to follow some of the trends that we'll talk about today, uh, such as modifying uh, projected demands, and those were prepared in 2014 and 2016. But as far as a comprehensive plan update, uh, the 2010 finalized in 2012 was the last time for the Indio Subbasin and the Mission Creek Garnet Hill uh, finalized uh, around 2013 was that last update there. And you'll probably cover this, Zoe, okay, but that you. plan was the basis of the alternative plan that we provided to DWR uh, under the Sigma requirement. We had to do bridging documents uh, to make it an official alternative plan, but I don't know whether you'll get into that level of detail or not. Yes, I will get into that level of detail elsewhere, but I guess I could just uh, you know kind of cover that right now. I don't want to disrupt your flow. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, 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 no. I just had a question if that was the, the last official uh, plan, and it was, so we had a couple supplementals after that. Thanks. Yes, so uh, for purposes of um, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act compliance, uh, the act did allow basins that had existing water management plans were adjudicated or could show um, that they had already achieved uh, sustainability for a, a certain period of time to submit alternatives. For uh, Coachella Valley, for the Indio Subbasin and Mission Creek, there were the existing water management plans that formed the basis of the alternative plan. Uh, but as Mr. Barrett stated, uh, there were also bridge documents created to crosswalk the alternative plans or the existing water management plans with the requirements of SIGMA. Uh, and there were also other supporting documents that were submitted. For example, our engineers reports that for many years had been doing the function of doing the groundwater balance uh, for the sub-basins and uh, broken up by area of benefits. So that whole package together is the alternative, but the uh, foundational plans were these water management plans. Uh, so this slide uh, shows the plan area for uh, the Indio Subbasin, uh, and this is similar to the plan area for the Coachella Valley Water Management Plan uh, 2010. Uh, it includes the whole of the Indio Subbasin as well as adjacent areas that currently or in the future might be served by groundwater pumped from the Indio Subbasin. Uh, this includes the communities on the east and west side of the Salton Sea, uh, as well as some areas um, um, further uh, up the basin that are within the sphere of influence or boundary of IWA uh, and CWA that in the future might receive um, um, their source of water from pumping in the Indio subbasin. So the plan area allows us to look at demands on the groundwater basin in a comprehensive manner. So why the need to up, uh, update water demand forecast? Um, 
So on the left here, we see the projections that the 2010 Coachella Valley Water Management Plan made uh, in terms of population growth. And so I'll run through some stats here. Uh, the 2010 plan uh, projected that by this year, 2020, uh, that plan area would have about 614,000 uh, permanent um, uh, and uh, um, seasonal residents, and that that would incre increase to about 1.1 million by 2045. Uh, you see um, embedded within this graph that the 2002 plan, which predated the 2010 plan, had projected uh, a lower level of growth. Um, but at the time that the 2010 plan, uh, that they started putting it together, which it uses 2005 as the baseline year, there was just a tremendous amount of growth, and this is what uh, the local communities, uh, municipalities uh, were, were projecting uh, in terms of growth. So what that translated to uh, in terms of demand was um, that uh, water demands were projected to increase to about 719,000 acre feet by 2020. Uh, and uh, continuing to increase to about 885,400 by year 2045. Um, in reality, we know that that population growth and water demand since, two, uh, since the 2008 recession uh, has been much slower. And so when we compare 2020 to projected, our current uh, population within the planning area is about 509, 510,000 or 21% uh, lower than projected. Uh, and in terms of water demands, uh, as we presented in the last annual report, combined water demands are about 595,000 acre feet per year, uh, about 17 lower than, than was projected uh, for a similar period. So lots of elements playing into this, uh, slower population growth, uh, as we get into 2020, but also slower growth projected uh, within the planning horizon. And it's a good time to say the planning horizon for this particular update is through 2045. Uh, so slower growth projected. And then um, our efficiency in water use has also increased. So we, we see a trend with each of these plans that particularly when it comes to municipal demands, but other demands in other sectors, uh, the factors get lower. And so you can accommodate um, more population per uh, you know, water unit. Uh, so th those are different factors playing in the water demand forecast that I will be showing you next. Okay. So uh, just touching on this briefly, uh, on, the, um, on the left here, you see the projected development in 2010 by general area. Uh, and then on the right, we see what is currently being projected by uh, the Southern California Association of Governments, which is the foundation for the data used to uh, update the plan. That information does take in general, local general plans from cities, municip uh, municipalities, county, et cetera. Um, and so in 2010, particularly in the thermal oasis area, uh, it was projected that about 300, up to 300,000 uh, new inhabitants would be added to that area. When we look at current projections, that element um, has gone away from the projections within the planning horizon of 2045. And instead, uh, population growth is expected to happen more as infill uh, around uh, the existing cities, uh, particularly uh, uh, the area of the city of Coachella, city of Indio, and then some level of conversion uh, of rather than development of idle lands, conversion of some existing land uses to urbanization. Uh, so quite a different picture in terms of development uh, within uh, that planning horizon of 2045. 
So this next slide uh, shows what the updated growth and water demand forecasts are uh, by 2045. Uh, as you see here, um, the new baseline year is 2016, but setting that aside uh, for a moment, uh, it's projected that in terms of permanent and seasonal residents, the planning area, uh, and you know, this is an important point. This is a plan for the whole of the This is a plan for the whole of the Indio Subbasin. Uh, so it does incorporate the growth and water demands uh, of the entire uh, planning area. Uh, and it does so too with, with water supply. As, as you know, we, we do uh, collaboratively manage parts of the Indio Subbasin uh, with uh, Desert Water Agency, but now under Sigma with uh, other GSAs. So, um, just going over some, uh, you know, just some brief statistics here. Uh, by 2045, we're projecting population uh, at about 721,000, or an increase of 42 uh, percent. And how that translates in uh, to demand projections, uh, the table here, as well as the graph, shows the demand projections by uh, different major sectors. Uh, and one thing of note is that the growth is expected um, to happen primarily in the municipal sector uh, with um, an increase of, uh, you know, roughly 55,000 acre feet or uh, 30%. Um, and then with those conversions of some ag lands to urban, you see uh, a decrease uh, in agricultural demand. Uh, a big change from the 2010 plan, uh, lots of conversations with uh, the Gulf Water Task Force, uh, Southern Association, uh, Southern California Association of Gulf. Uh, the, the growth in the Gulf industry that was projected in the 2010 plan is not expected. Uh, it, it's at best expected to stay uh, fairly stable. Uh, and there are a few water supply assessments uh, that added golf courses, so those have th those types of projects have been included uh, when we look at these uh, future water demands. So, uh, so we have a quick question. Yes. On the uh, permanent and seasonal resident. Um, the this 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 uh, chart that I'm looking at is a total of just that permanent and seasonal residents, and then um, do you have a sense of at least for for our district and for let's say Desert Water Agency, if, if that's a total there of urban and seasonal, what's um. um the percentage of seasonal is that like for our district is that like 10 percent five percent let's see so probably um let me hold on to that question we i i don't know that number yeah, off of the top of my head if i could pull yeah, out my calculator i could probably do i mean the a the quick estimate. 2020 to 2045 on population is 42% increase overall. And demand during that same period is up 7%. Correct. Um, yeah. So, so getting, the, getting to the question of, of sorry, so, so getting to the question of, of seasonal residents. <clears throat> Let me, let me let me finish my question so you can answer it um, as you answer the what you're going to answer. But where I was getting to was I was just trying to get a sense of how you incorporate seasonal population if it's a percentage of what a permanent resident would be. It, do you count them as half? Do you count them as quarter? What, what do you do then? Okay, so the. Thank you for the question. So the way that this was incorporated was a little bit different than in the 2010 plan, uh, which just came up with a population estimate. 
Uh, the approach that we have used this time is to look at housing unit developments. And so rather than developing a gallon per day per capita estimate, uh, we've developed a housing unit um, estimate. And so the, the way that, uh, you know, the way that the, the, the seasonal population is developed off of that uh, is uh, by, by looking at the um, uh, information from uh, the, 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 the travel bureaus, et cetera, uh, to, to kind of get an estimate of what that population is, but the water demands themselves. Um, so the population is a percentage, but the water demands themselves are based on housing units that are expected to be built in the area. And I know that we have uh, Rosalind Prickett on the line uh, who developed these demand estimates. So if, if you need more detail than that, uh, she can hop on uh, and uh, perhaps give us a little bit more information. I'm okay with, I'm okay moving forward. Yeah, so demand is based on housing units and it's purposely done that way so that you don't uh, end up with a bias uh, for uh, seasonal residents. Uh, the seasonal resident component uh, is how you get at the population is basically like, it's, it's based on an estimate of housing occupancy. And there's a lot of components that go into it, seasonal housing occupancy, um, um, tourism uh, data, et cetera, to then try to come up with a factor that you can increase uh, the projected permanent uh, residents. And for and that us- was, That was my point, Zoe. If, if, Zoe, I think that was my point. If, it, if it's not a big percentage of, of the overall population, then it's probably not that significant. I guess that's what I was trying to get at. If it's 5%, if it's 5%, then that variability isn't, doesn't really have that much of an impact. Yeah, and unfortunately, I don't have the number in, uh, in front of me. Um, I believe it's in the 15% uh, range, um, but I'll, I'll have to look that up more exactly uh, and, and get back to you all with that particular question. Thank you. However, in terms of combined housing units, it, it is an important part to include. Uh, in. Otherwise, we would be underestimating uh, the projected, you know, not just the current uh, per housing uh, water demand, but also um, uh, what our future water demands might be. So getting to the next element of this, we do see that 30% increase um, over uh, in the municipal sector over the planning horizon. However, when it comes to total demands, we're only seeing, uh, projecting a 7% increase. Uh, and that's um, in part because agriculture is going down. So we're adding more population. The water demand doesn't track one to one because uh, we expect higher efficiency. These municipal demand estimates do include what we're calling passive conservation. Uh, so this is the effect of, um, for example, our, our um, um, landscape ordinance, um, higher efficiency of new homes, uh, and uh, an additional element, which is the expected replacement uh, of um, indoor uh, plumbing um, features uh, to be more efficient over time. So over time, people replace their toilets, shower heads, et cetera. So it does include that element of passive conservation. Uh, so when you put all of that together, um, you, you, you do end up with only a 7% growth, but it is, you know, it's still, um, we're looking uh, at about 40,000 acre feet per year of, uh, total uh, increase in demand. <clears throat> okay, so the next element was the need to update the water supply assumptions. Um, 
The uh, 2010 plan, uh, when that was being created, the 2010 Coachella Valley Water Management Plan, uh, situations were very different. We were in uh, a state of overdraft, and what was being projected was a tremendous supply gap. Uh, think back to that demand of 880,000 acre feet plus per year. Uh, as we get into this update, the situation is very different. We do not um, uh, have overdraft as we've been presenting to the board over the years. If you look at the last 10 years, on average, we've added about 50,000 acre feet uh, per year to, to storage. So we have over the last 10 years since this plan was finalized. Uh, a positive groundwater balance, uh, and we're also uh, not projecting a supply gap, but there's a different piece that's different, and that's uh, sort of inc increased supply uncertainty. So we've seen decreases in average state water project reliability, um, possibility of shortage conditions in the Colorado River uh, lower basin, changes to local hydrology when you look at more recent data, and just in general, the need to consider uh, those impacts of recurring drought, climate change, and I'll share with the board that as we've had public workshops, um, which we've been having throughout this process, um, public workshops with stakeholders, uh, as well as um, uh, with uh, our Sigma Tribal Work Group, one of the feedbacks that we've been receiving, uh, and as well in the recently submitted Regional Urban Water Management Plan, one of the biggest comments that we've been receiving is the need to consider impacts of climate change and what we see with regards uh, to changing hydrology. Other things that needed to be updated, there are new projects uh, that weren't considered in the 2010 plan, like, like Paris seepage recovery, sites reservoir, Without that supply gap, we can defer projects at one point to meet that supply gap. There was the plan to desalinate perched groundwater in the East Valley up to 90,000 acre feet. Um, recycled water development has been slower, so that needed to be updated. Um, so all of these things together uh, are the elements that make us need to look at those water supply assumptions as we uh, assessed and updated these uh, the alternative plan update for the Indio Subbasin. So I'm going to quickly go over um, some of the things that we've observed in the data and how those are being incorporated. Uh, our planning assumptions or the, the scenarios uh, that were modeled do take climate change into consideration. Uh, and so these next sets of slides will kind of walk through um, the foundation for some of those assumptions. Uh, so with regards to watershed runoff, uh, as measured at the various stream gauges uh, that are located um, uh, within uh, the Indio Subbasin, um, if you look at the 50-year average, um, the measured amount plus the part that needs to be estimated, because not everything is gauged, is about 50,000 acre feet per year. If you look at the last 20 years, and you can actually extend that to 25, and it's a similar trend, uh, that drops down to about 30,000 acre feet per year. So we, we have been seeing uh, a, a drier hydrology with less uh, um, uh, estimated natural infiltration, but also what, you know, the foundation for this are actual measurements at stream gauges. Hey, um, Zoe, so I have a question about this. With the one, two, three, four, four super high runoff, watershed runoff years, is, would that be, that, that would add to the 50 year historical average, uh, help get it up over that 50,000. If you, if you looked at effective watershed runoff in terms of uh, water recharge, uh, I would imagine that those years, a lot of that watershed runoff just went out to the Salton Sea through the uh, Whitewater Channel. If, uh, would I be making a fair assumption in that if you took those years out, the actual effective um, recharge of runoff, would the difference between 30 and 50 might be a little bit less if you took those years out? 
Yes, certainly. I, I think, you know, just by what I would say eyeballing the graph, if you take those years out, you would, you know, that would definitely uh, drop that average to uh, a number closer to 30. Now, in, in terms of uh, going to the Salton Sea, we do have uh, two additional gauges uh, in the uh, Whitewater River Channel and uh, its extension into the Coachella Valley Storm Channel. So there are estimates of about how much is, uh, of that, of these particular type of runoff events are making it to the Salton Sea and it's estimated, I will need to check that, but it's in the, it's about 3%. Um, and um, so, so a lot of this, even even when you have these big events, you're still getting quite a bit of um, quite a bit of recharge. But uh, I, you know, I will agree with your point that if you were to exclude those very wet events that don't seem to be happening in the last 25 years, uh, that that is exactly one of the things that's contributing to this uh, uh, lower amount. But with regards to groundwater modeling, we do subtract the amount that's estimated to go out to the Salton Sea. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah, great, thank you, Zoe. So with regards to uh, the Colorado River, um, our Colorado River QSA entitlements, they are the largest uh, amount uh, or pot of imported water that the Coachella Valley has. Um, and while it has been uh, an extremely reliable source and CBWD's priority is high, uh, there's uh, worsening hydrologic conditions on the Colorado River. Uh, and so it seems important when we uh, model potential future scenarios to at least uh, consider the ongoing drought and potential effects of climate change uh, as, uh, as we look at different potential uh, future conditions. Uh, so we've considered um, uh, you know, the full allocation, the 424,000 acre feet per year plus the additional 35, which is the uh, uh, Metropolitan Water District State Water Project transfer. Uh, we've accounted for conveyance losses, which are about 5%. Uh, and we are assuming uh, the 5,000 acre feet per year that goes to MAD as part of delivering uh, part of the allocations at um, the Whitewater uh, River Groundwater Replenishment Facility through 2026. But we've also incorporated uh, some of uh, the, uh, as part of the climate change assumptions, we've also incorporated uh, some of the lower basin drought contingency plan contributions that CBWD would need to make um, beginning in, you know, uh, based on current projections that could be as early as 2023. So that has been incorporated and increasing up uh, through the through the tiers. So this is um, the climate change assumption, just to make sure that we are, you know, considering some of the pressures on this particular supply. Zoe, uh, quick question: What's that five thousand acre feet per year transfer? So as, as, la as part of the, the last uh, agreements with, uh, exchange agreements with Metropolitan Water District and uh, certainly uh, Robert Cheng is, uh, can add anything if he feels that I don't answer this uh, adequately, but as, as part of those new agreements, uh, MET can deliver part of uh, the Metropolitan Water District IID Colorado River transfer water, 20, 000, which is 20,000 acre feet per year at Whitewater. Uh, and uh, part of the agreement is that they would retain 5,000 of that 20,000 transfer. And currently that agreement goes through 2026. Uh, it, you know, future negotiations could look at that, but right now for, for this particular alternative plan update, we've assumed that it goes through 2026. Okay, thank you. 
So with regards to state water project reliability, uh, DWR's latest capability report uh, projected long-term reliability at 58%, declining to 52% uh, by um, in, in the 2040s uh, if the Delta conveyance project is not constructed. In reality, I, I've shown a couple of different averages here. If you go back to 2000, it's actually 55. Uh, and if you look at uh, 2007 through present, approximately 15 years, uh, and since the Wanger decision, the actual average, including this year, has been uh, 45%. We've also seen that within a seven-year window, we've had two 5% years. Uh, and uh, climate change, uh, additional delta pressures could uh, reduce that even further uh, if uh, the Delta Conveyance Project is not constructed. So for, for this plan, uh, we have assumed uh, a 45% reliability uh, with some very minor uh, additional, it's about 1.5% um, reduction uh, under climate change assumptions. Uh, and, and that is that 1.5 percent is fairly uh, moderate because the 45 percent already incorporates quite a few hydrologic conditions. Um, so we are using that 45 percent uh, with uh, climate change adjusting that. It ends up, like I said, it ends up being about 1.5 percent. And and this feels like a much better planning assumption to start with. Uh, more prudent uh, than going with 58, uh, reducing to 52. So uh, this slide shows state water project supplies. Uh, what you're looking at does include uh, CBWD and DWA's allocations. Um, you're looking at, in this particular graph, you're looking at that 45,000, which puts us uh, you know, at about 85,000 acre feet a year uh, on average, on average. Uh, and uh, it, it, it does include, as we move, um, and we'll be talking about the, um, the different scenarios that we modeled shortly, but as we look into the future, we do incorporate um, um, the addition of Lake Paris seepage recovery by 2025, uh, sites reservoir by 2035, and uh, construction of the Delta Conveyance Project, uh, which would increase reliability uh, by 2042. Uh, state water project supplies, everything that falls under that window, are allocated between um, the Indio Subbasin and the Mission Creek Subbasin. Uh, in accordance with the 2004 settlement agreement. Uh, currently, um, on average, uh, that's about 8% um, going to the Mission Creek groundwater replenishment facility uh, based on projections that increases to about 10% uh, uh, because growth and therefore pumping is expected to be relatively higher in the desert hot springs uh, area than in the uh, uh, West Whitewater River Management Area. And that allocation for the 2004 settlement agreement is based on pumping in those two areas. Zoe, what is the Yuba Accord? So uh, the Yuba Accord is, uh, it's an additional, I guess the best way to describe it, it's an additional, oh, there we go. <laughs> Is it even on this? Is, is the gray? I don't see it. Very, it looks like it's a very small percentage. Where is it? The number is 600 on average over the last uh, decade or so. It has been 610 acre feet per year. Where, where is it on this graph? You just can't see it. But it's, <laughs> okay. But we, we, did include it, we did include the average uh, in the uh, projection. Okay. Director Aguilar, um, to answer your question, it's a special contract set up by the state water contractor slash DWR with uh, Yuba County Water Agency. Uh, we funded some projects up there for source su substitution uh, for them to release water into the state water project during extremely dry years. So I think this started probably like in the 90s. Uh, CBWD has participated uh, every year in this. 
So as the uh, numbers show, it's not a reliable supply, but um, I think this year we're getting, you know, a modest amount uh, from that. I say less than a thousand acre feet. So. Thank you. I, it's just the first time I heard it. So of course, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to recycled water. Um, recycled water remains an important local supply that reduces aquifer pumping. Uh, there's also uh, side benefits to recycling uh, our wastewater, uh, in, in, you know, primarily uh, related to water quality and uh, eliminating uh, percolation of wastewater into the aquifer. Uh, when you look at the period of 2018 to 2019, uh, the, the three facilities in the Indio subbasin that currently produce um, recycled water uh, delivered about 14,000 uh, acre feet uh, per year, which is about 2% of the overall water demands for uh, the Indio subbasin and planning area. Uh, when we look at existing tertiary capacity and projected flow increases, uh, that could increase to um, over 20,000 acre feet per year. Uh, and based on projected growth increases in wastewater flows, uh, that, that leaves from current facilities that don't recycle uh, wastewater uh, or reclaim wastewater, uh, as well as from those growth flows, it, it could leave an additional 42,000 acre feet per year uh, of potential recycled water supply. Uh, the 2010 plan looked at a more aggressive conversion, uh, uh, integration of recycled water, uh, non-potable connections. There hasn't been the need to do these uh, because the growth just hasn't matched the projections. Uh, but this is a potential supply, um, and um, it, whatever connections are planned, whatever projects are, are, are within the planning horizon are being incorporated to a degree. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So not to be critical, but you may want to um, increase the tempo of your presentation. Will do. So uh, in terms of, um, you know, the board has seen these slides before. We present these every year. It shows that over the last 10 years implementing this plan, uh, we have um, seen increases in groundwater levels as well as a positive uh, increase in, um, in storage and that average, uh, which is a critical indicator of sustainability, uh, has been positive over the last 10 years, as I mentioned, on average 50,000 uh, acre feet. So uh, these are the type of conditions that we want to maintain uh, with this alternative plan and what is being considered uh, as we uh, updated this plan. So with regards to, um, you know, one of the critical elements of Sigma is groundwater sustainability. So with regards to the groundwater balance element, we look at projected demands, uh, projected supplies. Uh, we use the groundwater model uh, that exists, which I'll uh, talk about briefly, to develop groundwater balance for uh, different planning scenarios. Uh, the goal that was included in the 2010 plan of uh, meeting demands, um, uh, municipal demands with a 10% supply buffer are, are carried forth to this plan. Um, so, we are using the Coachella Valley uh, groundwater model. Uh, it has been updated uh, for the period of 2009 through 2019. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the technical deal, uh, details of the model, but I did wanna show that, uh, just briefly, that the simulated heads or groundwater levels uh, that have been measured uh, really uh, match uh, the, those predicted by the model. Uh, both in the uh, West Valley and the East Valley. And so we have a really good groundwater model uh, to be able to simulate potential future conditions. 
So in terms of modeled scenarios, uh, there were five scenarios that were selected for modeling. They include a baseline scenario. That baseline scenario includes current supplies and current projects that are on the ground. So it's the, if we do nothing else kind of condition, but demands do increase uh, over uh, the planning period. And then we have baseline, but with climate change assumptions. Uh, we modeled uh, near-term projects. Those are those that are planned uh, within the five-year capital improvement plan, things like OASIS, Palm Desert Groundwater Replenishment uh, Facility Phase Two, um, a number of non-potable connections, uh, and um, that includes climate change assumptions. Then uh, we did a future scenario, which includes all of the projects that were, you know, that were uh, projects and supplies that are currently planned through 2045, uh, source substitution projects, um, full implementation of OASIS, uh, and we bring in those additional state water project um, supplies or increase reliability with construction of the Delta Conveyance uh, facility project. And then a final scenario was if you take that future project and you increase agricultural demand, uh, what happens? And um, that would involve the development of an additional 8,000 acres of idle land. The reason to include that is that there's been a lot of questions uh, with pressure in other uh, areas of California with agriculture. Uh, what would happen uh, if that was one of the drivers for uh, agriculture increasing uh, in the East Valley. So we wanted to look at that. Okay, so this first set of, um, this first set of slide presents results and you know, this is a summary of the results and what we're seeing on, on the left-hand side is inflows and outflows. So on the upper part of, the, of that graph, inflows and outflows, and what is the net change in groundwater storage uh, on average over the 25-year planning horizon? Uh, and then on the right, uh, we look at the cumulative change in storage. So when we look at that 25-year average, under the baseline, uh, we are on average seeing uh, a net increase or the balance on average is uh, a positive 28,000 uh, acre feet per year. But when you incorporate those climate change assumptions, it, it, it drops to about 1,500. So very much in the noise uh, of planning assumptions. Um, and then it, when we look at Cumulative change in storage, I do want to point out something before I go over that graph, which is what's called the 25-year stress test period. Uh, Sigma requires 50 years of modeling to show that you can maintain uh, sustainability with your assumptions in the planning horizon uh, under a, a, a set of hydrological conditions, wet, dry years, et cetera. So that's, what you'll see in each graph in the blue box is that 25-year stress test. So under baseline conditions, we see um, at the beginning, uh, storage increases um, moderately to about five, uh, 500,000 acre feet. And then as you test it through some wet or dry periods, it does begin to decline. When you look at the climate change assumptions or that baseline with climate change, you're just hovering at that zero line, and as you test uh, those conditions over time, you do begin uh, to uh, lose storage. So a return to, to overdraft. Uh, the next uh, four slides are gonna look just at four wells uh, in Cathedral City, Palm Desert, City of Indio, uh, and uh, the thermal area. So our storage and groundwater levels are, are very related to each other. So you see a similar pattern where groundwater levels are lower with the climate change. Uh, but based on assumptions of water usage, you, you get a different spatial pattern uh, throughout uh, the Indio Subbasin. 
Uh, generally, things are a little bit more stable in the West, uh, but you see that as you move to Palm Desert with the climate change assumptions, uh, as, you t as you do that test, uh, stress test period, you do start to get declining water levels. Zoe, in all these slides, it looks like um, there's an increase in the baseline modeling year 27, 28. Is that because phase two of the Palm Desert replenishment facility goes in, or what drives those two lines to separate so dramatically starting in 27, 28? So it, let's. It, it, it's pretty apparent if you go back two slides. But so, so recall that right now we're looking at the yeah. baseline, so it doesn't have um, it, it doesn't have uh, the the um, Palm Desert groundwater replenishment facility. Um, so, you know, the model is running through a set of conditions, and um, y you get this. And then the divergence there starts, and it's you know, there's one point in time where climate change has a pretty dramatic effect. So you're baseline. getting you're getting increasing demands. And so, so demands mostly. Yeah, so the everything else in the baseline we're not assuming any additional projects. What you do is you start getting uh, that demand increase. Uh, and so you really start, you know, you really start to diverge um, as Okay. Yeah. I just thought there was it, one particular issue, but it, and when you when you look at these specific high uh, when you look at these specific hydrographs, another reason that they diverge that would take a lot of detail to get into is you start moving water back to the east uh, that we're currently taking advantage of in the west, uh, like the thirty five thousand acre feet. Okay. So you will see that as we move down uh, to the East Valley, then. The projections are that under uh, under the climate change assumption, but even to, to to some degree under the baseline, you you do get declining water levels, uh, and in the case of baseline, in some cases, those uh, would eventually return down to historical lows. Okay, thank you. So, in terms of um, again that near term, the projects that are planned in the next five years future, which includes the full suite of projects that are currently uh, planned within the planning horizon, and expanded ag. Um, in terms of groundwater balance, um, for the near term, you end up uh, on average with uh, a net, uh, with a, um, a positive groundwater balance of uh, 16,500 acre feet per year. Uh, for that future that incorporates uh, higher state water project reliability and towards the end of the planning period sites, that increases to uh, about 21,000. For that expanded ag, you do have higher demand uh, based on current per acre use. That's estimated 8,000 acres uh, of production would increase demands by about 40,000 acre feet per year. So that balance uh, lowers to about 12,000 positive uh, on average over that 25 year period. And then on the right, uh, you see that cumulative change in storage. Uh, we are able to uh, remain positive, uh, add um, a, a reasonable level uh, to storage uh, under both near-term, um, focusing on near-term, um, but also with expanded ag of about 500,000 acre feet, which is about two years of what we currently pump, to put it in, in some perspective. Now with the future projects, as um, the increased state water project reliability from the Delta Conveyance uh, project uh, comes in, you do, st you do start to see a ramp up uh, and uh, um, cumulative change in storage. Uh, but just as a reminder, we're also not increasing demands over that period. Uh, so if demand were to happen higher, if that project gets pushed out further, uh, any series of conditions that could happen could easily um, 
change uh, this outlook. But what we can show is that under these three different uh, planning assumptions, within the planning horizon, we are able to stay sustainable, uh, avoid overdraft, uh, and meet uh, water supply uh, demands for the basin. So just, I wanted to be clear. So on these different modeling scenarios, the future, each one includes the prior one, right? I mean, the future includes the near-term projects. That is correct. The expanded ag includes the future pro and, and the near-term. Correct. And they all include the climate change assumption. So, so the 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 the, this, the future and the expanded ag are kind of the two fully loaded ones. Correct. Yeah. One with an additional forty thousand acre feet. And, and you know, one could say, okay, if you have faster growth, that that particular scenario gives you a window into the fact that you can accommodate more demand. Yeah. Um, where it happens in the basin would be slightly different, so I wouldn't draw a lot of conclusions uh, about the placement of that demand when we look at the at the next set of slides. Okay. So again, uh, same set of hydrographs, um, Cathedral City, Palm Desert, City of Indio, Thermal, uh, and uh, to President Powell's point, the expanded act does include future assumptions, so that drives why those lines kind of separate out uh, after 2042 uh, when there's uh, increased state water project reliability and you've been getting that benefit of water from sites. Um, I, 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 Good luck. You know, don't, don't necessarily want to draw a lot of conclusion from this. This is where the model gets a little bit tricky. We're able to make general conclusions, but remember we're putting demand and recharge in particular parts of the model. Uh, so it's you know just more broad conclusions that we can draw from this, but uh, what we see is uh, that we get increased groundwater levels uh, that, that stabilize, and as you go into the stress period with all the future assumptions, you can get additional increase, but again, you're holding uh, demand steady, so it doesn't account for uh, you know, additional growth that might happen uh, beyond the planning horizon. And we see a similar pattern uh, throughout, albeit uh, more attenuated uh, in the East Valley, uh, where, you know, under all conditions, we're able to um, gain some storage, increase groundwater levels uh, some, and maintain those uh, uh, sustainably, not go below uh, historical levels, which will become important in uh, subsequent slides. So uh, that's, uh, you know, just to 10,000, 35,000 foot um, summary of the planning assumptions, demand, et cetera. So um, as with the 2010 plan, uh, the alternative uh, plan, update, uh, really updates all these planning assumptions. Uh, the scenarios are sim uh, used to simulate a range of potential conditions to ensure that forecasted demands can be met while maintaining, uh, not returning to overdraft, and with Sigma uh, being able to achieve those Sigma sustainability goals, uh, avoiding uh, significant and unreasonable, undesirable results. But we still maintain the flexibility to implement projects as needed. Um, whether that be speeding up, slowing down, as was done with the 2010 plan. And Sigma in particular provides a very robust framework for doing that. We're doing this update, we'll be implementing the plan. Uh, we're you know, continuing to monitor as, we, as we've always done, uh, including uh, enhancing some of that monitoring. We'll be reporting on an annual basis and evaluating what we're seeing so that we can adjust as needed so that flexibility, we're not locked into anything. Uh, we can still use the same adaptive management framework that has been being used. So I um, just wanted to briefly men go through these. Um, uh, DWR did have specific, Department of Water Resources did have specific recommendations. 
They wanted us to have quantitative thresholds for groundwater level storage and subsidence. Uh, this sort of mimics the framework of sigma in which you have to establish minimum thresholds. In other words, a level you will not go below because if you go below that level, uh, you expect to have significant and undesirable results uh, with regards to chronic groundwater levels, uh, lowering of uh, levels, storage, subsidence, and uh, saltwater intrusion, water quality, et cetera. So they asked us for these types of quantitative uh, thresholds for, uh, like I said, groundwater level storage and subsidence. Um, and uh, the approach that has been taken um, is to look at the historical lows at uh, 57 key wells and to use that historical low based on actual measured levels as the level that we do not want to go below. This is for the Indio subbasin where there has been subsidence and there, uh, this is a, a very um, prudent approach because we can say up to these levels, the negative results were not uh, significant or unreasonable. So it's a very defensible position. So this, this next slide shows uh, the, 50, the location of the 57 key wells. They're very well distributed uh, throughout the subbasin. Uh, and the other element of minimum thresholds is for sigma, not being sustainable doesn't mean we're, we're, you know, we're not meeting objectives at one well. It has to be um, over a significant part of the basin. So those minimum thresholds um, have been defined as being 25% of wells. Uh, and we also want to give ourselves the flexibility to react. Uh, this is a big sub-basin where sometimes management actions take a while to uh, show results. So that minimum threshold at 25% wells over uh, five uh, monitoring seasons. Uh, and starting with the next set of annual reports, we'll begin to report on um, uh, levels at these 57 wells relative to those minimum thresholds. Minimum thresholds are not what we're managing to, it's what we don't want to go below. Uh, DWR also requested uh, that we map water quality constituents of concern. Uh, for this alternative plan, uh, there's been quite a bit of groundwater analysis done. Uh, we've mapped uh, eight constituents of concern uh, that were identified by a mixture of DWR, the 2010 plan, as well as conversations among uh, the GSAs. Um, so the, there'll be cross sections um, showing the vertical distribution for some constituents, uh, time plots for some of those that are, uh, you know, ch potentially changing in some areas over time. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into detail here. This is just an example of uh, the type of maps that we're creating to meet that DWR request. Uh, DWR also requested that we integrate and approve uh, Coachella Valley Salt and Nutrient Management Plan. Uh, so as uh, the board is familiar with, uh, there are now eight water and wastewater agencies collaborating to update the 2015 Coachella Valley Salt and Nutrient Management Plan. Uh, the first step in that was to finalize a work plan uh, that would define the scope of work that we are going to take to update that plan. Uh, and that has been submitted to the regional board and we're working through our comments to finalize that. We'll be providing uh, the regional board a presentation at the end of August. And they also requested uh, a more detailed groundwater monitoring plan that has been created, submitted, approved, and it's already being implemented. So we'll be able to report on that uh, in this update, uh, as well as continue to report on that in, with our annual reports. Um, salt water, uh, salt and sea, salt water intrusion was something that was identified in the 2010 plan. Uh, and DWR wanted us to kind of move us towards an objective um, with regards to that element. 
in reality, what we're presenting is technical data because conditions have changed from the 2010 plan. Groundwater levels are higher. The saltancy has receded. So when you look at that head differential, starting in about 2015, there's minimal uh, saltwater intrusion and there's actually a greater net flow to the Salton Sea. Uh, agricultural drains, uh, they were included in the 2010 plan because they're uh, having that uh, higher groundwater levels, pressure, pressurized uh, lower aquifer leading to higher ground, higher drain flows, uh, as well as the salt export that that con contributes to is beneficial. So it was included in the 2010 plan. Um, and um, the DWR asked, should there be a minimum threshold associated with this? Uh, our answer is no. Uh, this is a proxy for beneficial conditions. All of the model scenarios show continued increasing drain flows. Uh, but we want to look at this relationship in more detail, and it's more likely that some direct measure like groundwater levels would be a better metric uh, of the intended positive benefits than uh, actual measurements of drain flow. And finally, they, they asked us to map groundwater-dependent ecosystems. Uh, this has been done uh, by analyzing um, data that was prepared to support the Sigma process, uh, and uh, those maps uh, and conclusions will be included in the alternative plan update. Okay. So moving on to the uh, Mission Creek Subbasin alternative plan, uh, as I mentioned, this will be um, briefer because it incorporates many of the assumptions that we have already gone through. Uh, so the plan area includes uh, the area that you see in this map highlighted uh, in green. Uh, and uh, essentially that includes the GSA area for the Mission Creek Subbasin, but also the areas in Desert Hot Springs that are being served, or in the future there's additional development would be being served uh, from uh, groundwater pumped in the Mission Creek Subbasin. Um, just a reminder that because of the nature of how that particular uh, initial Mission Creek Garnet Hill plan was created, that there is an overlap in the Garnet Hill. Uh, and while this Mission Creek sub-basin alternative plan update retains uh, the Garnet Hill, anything being done for that area has been coordinated with the team doing the Indio sub-basin alternative plan. The Garnet Hill sub-area per DWR is part of the Indio sub-basin. So uh, with respect to, to Sigma compliance, it was important to include that area in the Indio sub-basin plan. So with regards to population projections, we see a similar story here where what was projected in the 2013 plan has not happened. Uh, when we look at um, current uh, projections, uh, we are looking at an increase by 2035, uh, but it's more moderate, um, and uh, it involves an interesting, a very similar population increase to the Indio sub-basin, although um, um, you know, focused in a different area, with in, uh, population increasing by 2045, approximately 45%. In terms of water demand projections, uh, municipal again forming uh, the sector where increases are expected. Uh, there is some private pumping in the Mission Creek sub-basin. Uh, right now there, there isn't really um, any foundation for us to assume that uh, based on the type of development that's expected that that element would increase, so that has been held steady. Uh, so when you combine this outlook, um, it, it is an increase of about five to 6,000 acre feet per year over that planning horizon pe uh, period, or uh, approximately 33%. Uh, 
the sources of supply, uh, a much simpler system uh, when you look at the Mission Creek subbasin. Um, but you do, you do have that same element of natural recharge and that same trend uh, of decrease in that natural local replenishment from mountain, mountain uh, front recharge, um, decreasing, if you look at the 50 year average, about 18,000 acre feet per year, and if you look at the last 25 years, that's uh, down to uh, 12, just over 12,000 acre feet per year. I, I touched a little bit on how state water project supplies are allocated uh, per the 2004 settlement agreement. So the amount that goes to Mission Creek based on that agreement does increase over time uh, as a percentage. And uh, currently there are no, uh, besides the improvement and reliability, there are no major actual physical projects planned. Uh, Mission Springs Water District uh, is planning a recycled water project. Uh, and that recycled water project is actually in the, the, the plant, it's called the Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant, is actually in the Garnet Hill sub area. So this affects the balance because you're, over time, you're moving what would be return flows to the Mission Creek sub basin, you're moving them to Garnet Hill. Uh, but their plan is to bring them back to the Mission Creek uh, either as uh, a uh, indirect potable recharge or um, uh, uh, direct deliveries uh, for non-potable uses. So similar to uh, Indio Subbasin, we have a groundwater model. It is a well-calibrated groundwater model that's being used uh, to look at projections and uh, the uh, groundwater balance, groundwater levels. Uh, the red line shows the model domain. Uh, it has been expanded to include desert hot springs, which is a good thing because uh, one of the things that DWR is very interested in is uh, flows of potentially higher salinity water from desert hot springs uh, into Mission Creek. Uh, again, similar to uh, what I showed for the Indio Subbasin, uh, you have modeled groundwater levels or heads uh, versus measured uh, and in you know just a, a very well calibrated model one that we feel uh, confident in terms of uh, using for for uh, looking at a range of future scenarios in terms of modeled scenarios it follows a similar theme as in the indio sub basin uh, with baseline in baseline with climate change assumptions. A little difference here is that the wastewater, uh, the wastewater treatment plant um, is already on route to being uh, constructed and permitted, so that has been incorporated. It's so in the near term that that has been incorporated into the baseline. Uh, near term projects then basically includes taking that, the only near term project uh, that has been identified is taking that back uh, from the Garnet Hill sub area, taking it back to Mission Creek and using those wastewater flows uh, as a recycled water source by uh, Mission Springs Water District. Future projects, uh, it's primarily su supplies, increased reliability, uh, sites, et cetera, that are incorporated. And, uh, so this is a slightly uh, busier graph because it shows all inflows and outflows um, over a very long time period. Uh, and, but, it, but it does give us an opportunity to illustrate something um, that um, we have done. Um, in, we've done it both in the Indio subbasin and in, uh, in the Mission Creek subbasin in terms of modeling. Um, in terms of recharge variability, uh, both natural and imported, uh, the consultants have used uh, a more recommended approach uh, used by USGS where you use uh, typical natural variability for natural recharge. So the patterns that you've seen, uh, to capture that variability so that you have uh, you know, a, a closer 
um, idea, you're, you're better able to look at the response of the basin um, under variable conditions rather than just assuming that those are a steady number. However, when we talked about assumptions, things like 45% uh, for state water project reliability, this variability essentially uh, averages itself to that 45%. Um, so we're still using this notion of average assumptions, but adding um, annual variability to it. So um, here you see the, the results for um, the baseline scenario and uh, baseline with climate change. Uh, if you focus roughly on the middle of the graph, um, the, the planning period starts with uh, a drier cycle. Uh, so both um, under baseline, you do see some reductions, and then as you get into a wetter cycle, uh, that goes up. Um, and uh, by the time that you get past that stress period to about 2070, you're adding about 60,000 acre feet of storage, um, or you know roughly what is pumped in a three-year period. Uh, with climate change, again, you you get that uh, initial reduction in storage, but you are actually going below the zero line because you're recharging less. And then you put it through a, a wetter period and you do see some recovery, but by the time that you get to the end of the stress period, um, you are uh, essentially back in overdraft. And again, similar to India, you're not increasing demands, so when you, you really need to take that into consideration, you're just taking the same demand and seeing how it does over time with different um, uh, hydrology. With so we uh, have a couple questions. Um, just on the bottom of this graph, um, is ET, is that evapotranspiration? Yes, that is evapotranspiration. So why would, just a question, why would the evapotranspiration go up in wet years and uh, somewhat lower in dry years? So I believe that so I'm what... I'm specifically at... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I believe that perhaps... 2026, I was looking at 2026 through 2030, and that, that green line goes up to a couple of mountaintops as well as, the, but the hydrology goes up too. And then through 2034 to 38, it goes down as well as the water um, volumes. But it's water loss to evaporation time. So I, let's try to work through this because I think that what you're looking at is actually, uh, if you go towards the ledge and towards the, uh, the far right side, that's actually ch annual change in storage. The ET component or uh, evapotranspiration is so small that you actually can't, can't really see it on the graph. Yeah. The, the green line is not ET, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the thicker ones are bar graphs, uh, and the two things that are line are uh, annual change in storage and cumulative. Far right of the ledger. Oh, okay, so that, that thick, sure. bold line is, um, is climate change storage, not change in storage. Just Correct. Change, change uh, in storage. I got it. In the legend, the, the, the thicker lines are part of the bar graph, and if yeah. you can, I, you know, ET is such a small component that at this scale you really can't see it. What you're seeing is that annual change in storage. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm zooming in and I see that, I see the ET. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the That's clarification. Yeah. So, Again, this near-term project, all it does is bring uh, that recycled water that used to be returned flows to Mission Creek. It brings it back in uh, to Mission Creek. And so even though we're seeing some declines, if we were to enter you know, a consecutive set of uh, dry, a dry cycle like we've seen before, uh, we do manage to stay um, just above uh, the, the zero line. And when you cycle through um, the entire 50-year uh, period, you end up uh, 
with projected uh, cumulative uh, change in storage of about 60,000 acre feet. Uh, when you move into future projects, uh, and remember, uh, the higher reliability comes in at about uh, 20, um, uh, 2042, that's the assumed uh, date. So you see a similar pattern uh, in future projects with climate change, uh, but then after 2042, it, it really takes off. Um, and you know these 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 assumptions are based on that uh, split that's based on the 2004 settlement agreement. Uh, let's just say that what we're showing is that under those sets of conditions, uh, the Mission Creek subbasin, uh, that as long as that water comes back and uh, if there's increased reliability, if there aren't further decreases. Uh, uh, the Mission Creek Subbasin will be sustainable with regards to storage levels. Uh, so um, I, I only, for Mission Creek Subbasin, I only picked two wells, uh, one in uh, the upper part of uh, the Mission Creek Subbasin and one closer uh, within CDWD's GSA area, closer to where we uh, uh, have our pumping wells. Um, and under, at both of these wells show that under baseline conditions, you get um, declining levels, and if you project that out over time, and this is again, without even considering further increases in demand, you would, um, you would fall uh, below historical levels and even possibly past the minimum thresholds, which I'll talk about shortly uh, for the Mission Creek Subbasin. Under the near term, in the future, um, you know, we're able to either maintain groundwater levels or uh, increase them, similar to storage, and that really picks up after 2042 during the stress test period. So a slightly different approach uh, to minimum thresholds in um, the Mission Creek Subbasin. Uh, just a couple of reasons that I want to mention for why we're using this different approach. The Mission Creek Subbasin is a smaller subbasin. Uh, there are less wells that can be used um, as key wells without having a well everywhere. Uh, so you have to be cognizant of the game of percentages. Uh, but in addition, uh, unlike uh, the India Subbasin and the Mission Creek Subbasin, there's never been uh, you know, a recorded history of, of subsidence, et cetera. So we can integrate a little bit more flexibility into the minimum threshold. Um, so we're showing a representative well here. Uh, the um, vertical line is when recharge was started. Uh, and you see that the green line looks at uh, not the historical low, although often that it's equivalent to the historical low, but 2009 levels. The uh, 2013 Mission Creek Garnet Hill actually um, uh, put forth 2009 as an objective. So in their review of this plan, DWR, their recommendation is just show us how you're gonna measure and report that you are meeting that 2009 objective. Um, so uh, there's gonna be nine key wells. Uh, the objective is the 2009 level as measured at these wells, but the minimum threshold allows us to go uh, below that one standard deviation. So it integrates the variability of individual measurements at wells uh, Historically, different parts of the subbasin, depending on how far away they are from the recharge facility, uh, really have um, marked difference in terms of uh, what we've seen in terms of fluctuations in groundwater levels. Um, and so this next slide uh, shows the distribution of key wells. Uh, again, even though there's only nine wells, you have uh, a very good distribution of wells. Uh, and the minimum threshold uh, is being defined as uh, crossing uh, 
in other words, that minimum threshold where we believe that we would have significant and undesirable results is being set as uh, three consecutive years at uh, four of the wells, or 45%. Again, um, because it is a smaller sub-basin, you, you can sort of right the ship uh, somewhat faster. Um, and so that's why we're using three years instead of five. Uh, similar to the Indio Subbasin, the key wells will also serve as a proxy for storage. Uh, there's, there hasn't really been evidence of subsidence, so we weren't asked to set a minimum threshold for subsidence, but it is something that we're starting to look at to make sure that we can uh, definitively and defensively say that there uh, hasn't and isn't uh, subsidence in the Mission Creek Subbasin. And again, we'll be reporting on all of this on an annual basis these levels, minimum thresholds at key wells. Uh, so in, in terms of next steps, uh, we will be having a draft alternative plan update for agency review, uh, more or less mid uh, to late August. That's that first time that we'll see the full document prepared for internal review. Uh, we'll be having uh, another public and tribal workshop roughly uh, in uh, late August. And then uh, we'll move uh, to public review, which currently is planned for late September, uh, public review period of 30 days. And during that public review period, we will be having uh, public and tribal workshops uh, to present everything fully and uh, you know, to have an opportunity to answer questions or receive additional comments. Uh, we are planning to bring both plans for board adoption on December 7th, uh, and then we will uh, be submitting by January 1 of 2022. The other GSAs also need, uh, have, need to have their governing bodies adopt the plan, and, and that's included in the schedule. I, I believe right now it's uh, Coachella uh, Water Authority and DWA are the first ones that will be bringing it for adoption right around the same time. So with that, uh, that concludes my presentation and uh, happy to take any additional questions on anything that has been prepared here, uh, any feedback from the board on uh, the approach that we've taken. Um, I just have one, first of all, very impressive work. Thank you, Zoe, for that. But So my question really relates to your last point regarding the other uh, agencies that we're collaborating with. Um, so as they go through their process of adoption and, and hearings, um, I, do they, I mean, are there modifications made based on each jurisdiction? And if there are, how does that affect our plan? And how does that interact? So um, we, when, when we, our plan is that when we, when we bring this to board on, uh, when CBWD, uh, when staff bring this to you all on the 7th, it will be a final plan. Uh, the internal review period, the public review period, uh, the additional public workshops, that's the time that we will incorporate comments. Uh, and I, I know, you know, we, we have this study session, DWA is about to have a study session. Uh, I haven't heard on the timing of uh, when other agencies will do their study sessions, uh, but the, there's a lot of review periods integrated into this to make sure that when we come on the 7th, uh, it is you know a final plan with no uh, further edits. So that is certainly um, something that uh, feedback is appreciated on as we get closer uh, um, to the public review period when we'll have you know, a draft admin version. Uh, if there's anything that you all want us to come back to and present in a similar setting or in a shorter version uh, uh, at a regular board meeting, that's something that we will definitely do. I know you and Steve and Melanie have been very um, instrumental in guiding and um, I, don't, I won't say controlling, but keeping the consultants on track. 
Um, and I noticed that there's nobody here from any of the other GSAs for your presentation to us. Are you going to be attending the CWA or the IWA or the DWA uh, presentations to their board, or are they going to have their own staff do that, or how does how do you think that's going to work? So the, the only model that I have right now where they have defi definitively scheduled one is DWA, uh, and uh, we have shared uh, this presentation with them. Um, you know, of course, they're fine tuning it to things that their board uh, um, may be sensitive to. Maybe sensitive to, I mean, uh, et cetera. But we're, we're definitely collaborating on that, and I, you know, will definitely plan on attending uh, uh, those or watching them in recording if I happen. But not necessarily presenting. I mean, you yeah. have taken a very strong leadership role in in the conduct of these uh, plans, studies, and consultant work. And so I was just wondering how um, that kind of bled over to the other GSAs. I, I'm, I think we're very fortunate to have you here to participate in these. And I just didn't know whether they were counting on your same participation or not. So far, no, but, but like I said, with, with, uh, you know, with Desert Water Agency, um, we're, we're really closely coordinating. I mean, obviously, um, you know, we're, two of the agencies uh, importing water um, have management agreements for uh, the, waste, wet, the West Whitewater River subbasin. So there, there's been a lot of close coordination among right. all the GSAs. I know that I've been talking to them as they prepare for their um, first board study session. But should anyone need, in, you know, any of the other GSAs need um, any support in presenting, uh, you know, certainly this is a collaborative effort and the materials that are available to us are available to all, uh, notes, input, uh, even a guest appearance. Understood, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think we had a question from a director on the... We, we did. So Director Nelson um, in the chat asked, uh, in relation to the SWP reliability, this plan appears to go from 58% to 45%. Is this a CVWD move or a statewide perspective? Please discuss further. Mm -hmm. So let, let me first of all clarify that I included uh, the DWR capability report number as a you know just as a general reference uh, in reality uh, the 2010 plan uh, assumed 60 percent reliability dropping to 50 uh, without the construction of uh, uh, the Delta conveyance facility so a we have not um, actualized 60 percent uh, over the last 10 years and Based on the data, we think that 50 uh, without um, some real, uh, without, you know, the projects being built and, and the reliability being addressed, uh, we think that even the 50 is, um, you know, just not, doesn't put us in a very safe comfort zone in terms of planning. Um, is it um, a statewide approach? Um, I, I don't think that I can fully answer that. I know that um, that folks may be integrating the 58%, but I also do know that uh, people are also looking at other scenarios. And so at the end of the day, um, what, what we're really looking at here is the planning scenarios that uh, were developed uh, in collaboration between the GSAs with input from uh, executive uh, management uh, in collaboration with DWA, scenarios that we felt and assumptions that we felt put us uh, in um, a good condition in terms of looking at uh, what might be uh, coming down the pike. So, so you're, you, I think you, what you're saying is that the 45% number was developed locally. It's not something that the state published. It, well, it's actually, it's a, 
I, I guess you can say the state has published it in as much as it's the actual number that we've seen since 2007. So we're using actual data right. instead of model data. It's so a local construction. Yeah, right. They, we, we constructed it locally, collaboratively with your Correct. group based on recent data. And, and if the folks in the back could put slide 13 up on the uh, monitor, if you've got a keyboard, just push one, three, there you go. Yeah, I mean, we can uh, see how, it, so you used math to get to that number. You took an average of those years. Correct. And yeah, it seems reasonable. I mean, I, it makes me a lot more comfortable than 50. Um, it's not as rosy though. No, but it seems more realistic. Yes. Sadly. No, I, I would agree. Uh, I would agree with John and, and thank you, Zoe, for the explanation. Uh, you know, kind of my question revolves around, I mean, it's the same, same thing we do with the OPEB, right? The, 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 the agency, uh, CalPERS, the, the, they have a projection and it's based on, uh, I think, uh, more of anecdotal evidence and it, it appears that this 45, um, uh, and so we use 5% in that case versus their 7%. And so in this case, this is actual actual. We're not going under uh, at that 45%. So I appreciate the explanation on that. Thank you. That's, that's, yeah. good. that's not good, but, 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 yeah. but good. So yeah. We, yeah. I have a question. This is, uh, uh, this is Anthony. Um, great presentation. Great job. Um, thank you very much. This is a lot of work. The, the only numbers that, um, that, that I'm concerned with is the population growth. Um, so in the next 25 years, um, we're looking at adding um, projected 210,000 residents. And doesn't that seem high? Yeah, if you could put slide nine up, please. I think he's looking at the difference between 2020 and uh, 2045. Yeah. yeah. So, D Director uh, Bianco, uh, the way that I would answer that question is these are planning assumptions. And, um, you know, clearly we don't have a, you know, we don't have a crystal ball. So we, we're choosing assumptions that we feel support uh, good planning. Um, if you, you know, if, if you take the last 10 years, the 200 seems like a lot. If you go back to the conditions under where the, the 2010 plan where, uh, you know, population growth, I think was, it was projected to average 4% per year uh, based on what had been observed, then um, you would say that maybe we're being a little bit too conservative. I, I think we, we've tried to strike a balance. Um, and, um, you know, I, I would point out that, for example, um, something that has been coming up a lot, uh, you know, just in the last year and recent months uh, in a different area, is this uh, housing element component. Uh, so when, when you look at uh, the housing element component uh, in the Southern California Association of Government saying, hey, this is how much, you know, this is how much growth uh, we expect in Southern California. This is where we think it's going to happen. Uh, this is how many homes we think, uh, you know, you should plan for building. Then some people might say that we're, we're being, you know, we're not being conservative enough. Um, so the other piece is we're looking at a planning horizon of 2045, which is 25 years. Uh, whether that happens faster or slower, when you look at the city's general plans in longer term, I, I think we will, we could easily, I, I don't want to say we will because that's uh, too assertive, but I think we could easily get to that number. Uh, and it feels like a very prudent number to plan to. 
I mean, I, I would only offer that, you know, when you go back through the new meter install data in the general manager's report, I think it was about 2004, 2006, we were installing about 4,000 new meters a year. Now, honestly, we have not recovered um, from that. Uh, recently, I think we've been doing about 800. But we are we are on uh, track to do over 1,000 this year. Again, it pales in comparison. But there are some pretty big developments um, that are now beginning to visit us much more frequently. You've got University Park in Palm Desert. You've got the Section 31 across from Sunnylands and the Annenberg State in Rancho Mirage. You've seen on the news the talk about uh, Coral Mountain uh, in La Quinta. I'm not aware of anything in Coachella or Indio right now, but I'm sure they've got stuff. We're just not their municipal water agency, so the visibility there is not as great. But I do think um, you know we're kind of on the cusp now, and with COVID, you, you see the trend for a lot of folks to reevaluate um, their current situation in uh, high density areas to consider you know, being able to work from home. Uh, I don't know how that's actually gonna be reflected here. We're not a land use agency, so we kind of have to rely on others. But I, I, I can see an, in, uh, an uptick from uh, where we were you know, in the last 10 years since I've been here. And the, and the projections I mean, so through 2040. This report is, is, I'm sir. sorry, please go ahead. I mean, this, this report, I mean, is rosy. I mean, to me, I mean, this, this is a very good report. It reflects uh, on our, on our, um, on our desert and our planning. And, uh, it, it shows, uh, an increase of, uh, 40%, uh, 200,000 residents. So if it, if it happens, Great. If it doesn't happen, then it just makes us in a better position, I think. I think the really valuable piece is that we can look at the population growth and um, kind of convince ourselves that we're doing an adequate job from a water planning standpoint to support that growth. I think it'd be very different if the growth um, were not able to be supported. So. I mean, that is the value of the plan um, that, that staff has been able to produce, you know, relying on population projections by others. I, but I still, I, I agree, it's, it's, it shows that we are able to support um, the area. I think it's a good number. I think we could, I mean, it's, it's a little scary that we might actually grow faster than that. That'd be my fear. <laughs> but to Jim, but to Jim's point, um, and being looking around the state, this is one of the best plans that the uh, water quality control board is ever going to see. And, and, um, hats off to, to Coachella, Valley Water District and uh, the other GSAs in the in the valley um, for you know working together and putting this together. But especially hats off, Jim, to uh, you know the water management team that includes all the people that like Robert working on the state water project and Zoe working on on this and Steve Bigley working on uh, uh, the uh, replenishment charges, uh, not charges, but the replenishment uh, programs, uh, and I'm leaving out many, but it takes a big, big team to do this, and I have not seen a better plan in the entire state, so hats off to everybody involved. Yes, thank you. You know, it makes me wonder if the state really would appreciate what's here. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, it, partly we're meeting a regulatory requirement which is a kind of a mechanical process, you know, you, do, did you satisfy this? Did you satisfy that? And I'm guessing that's how they're going to look at it. But really it's, it's, it's what we do, you know, I mean, this is, we've been doing it long before Sigma and uh, it's pretty amazing all the different efforts that have kind of come together to produce this most important thing we do, I think. 
I'm not necessarily meaning Sigma. That's just part of the, that's sort of a side effect. You know, it's the idea that we can sustain the population and the economy here, even with all the trouble, you know, I mean, you're, you, you know, there's going to be definitely, I think, you know, haircuts on the Colorado River. Hopefully it's done in a fair way. And, you know, whether these projects get built in the state, <laughs> hard to say. I mean, really, you know, are they going to build a conveyance facility is, is that kind of thing? But, uh, but we're ready for it, no matter what they do. Thank you. Any, any other comments or questions? Good. Well, then, um, uh, John, I yeah. just, uh, go ahead. John, I just want to, I just want to thank Zoe as well, uh, for an amazing presentation. I, and I, to Jim's point, uh, she has been the person that's been kind of driving this effort, uh, making sure that everybody, um, is on task, including the consultants who have also done a great job in putting together all the data from the different agencies and, and compiling that to create models and, and create all these different scenarios uh, with a lot of different assumptions. But so it is, it is a complicated document. I think that to the points that you've made, um, we probably make it look easy uh, just because it's something that I think we've been doing for a long time, way before Sigma. So the, um, it almost seems like the foundation to a lot of this was already in place. It was just a matter of updating things or tweaking things. But, uh, you know, a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different levers uh, that you can move. Um, and I think to, to, to your point, um, whatever happens, I think whatever happens in terms of the supplies from this bucket or another bucket, um, where it seems like we're prepared to to be able to adjust and and uh, do what we need to do to make sure that uh, we have a sustainable uh, basin and that uh, we continue to manage uh, our water here in the Coachella Valley. Um, I think we're in a very unique position and uh, I, I think you're right. I think that uh, the state's probably looking at it from a very mechanical standpoint where we can check off this box, check off this box, but I feel like this document is just doing a lot more than that. So um, I just I just want to thank uh, Zoe for kind of just grabbing it by the horns and, and really owning it. So great job. Yeah, good. Thanks. You know, going back to the original water management plan, it was the, not the 2010. It was the 2002. 2004. Yeah, and and you go in there and you look at the assumptions. And uh, I don't know how many golf courses that were already here. There was close to 100. And the assumption projected four new golf courses a year for 25 years. So there was an additional 100 golf courses that we were really getting ready for, right? I mean, we, our job wasn't to decide whether or not somebody's putting in a golf course, but, but to get ready for it and to be there to, to, to be able to sustain that. And of course, that never happened. They they were doing four a year. There was several years where they did four new golf courses a year, so it was a reasonable projection, but it didn't happen. And and that's a huge difference in in water use. You know, I mean, that's I think in, um, when when you look at the 2010 plan, it it basically represented an increase of sixty thousand acre feet a year. Um, yeah. Yeah, and now so, we just have a completely different message. On no, and and so my, I guess my point is, you know, we need to continue to to be a realistic about what we think the the projections should look like, based on what we know, because you know you only know what we know so far, and you know it's not going to be accurate. It'll we'll miss on some. We might hit some others uh, correctly, but um, but then we adapt and move on, right? I mean, we know that that's going to be a big part of this process. It's just um, you get you get as good a projection as you can, and then you deal with the reality and and adjust as needed in the future. Um, we're lucky because we have so many different sources, and um, I think a lot of opportunity to to adjust because of that. So. 
Good. Well, we have no other business today, so we are adjourned. Okay. Thank you. 10.30. Not bad. <laughs>